Good day and welcome to the Math Salon. My name is Dr. Anna Mendel. For those of you who are new to the Math Salon, please welcome and feel at home. The Math Salon is a place where students who really want to improve their mathematical skills, learn more about basic and fundamental concepts of mathematics, come and get some experience. Today's video is about the solutions to the quiz that we did last week. The quiz that was done on the 24th of October 2021 for the advanced levels. I start first of all by thanking all the students who participated in the quiz. I thank you for your courage and I hope that the purpose of this initiative is achieved in you, which is mainly to improve your mathematical skills. After every quiz, you should have the feeling that you've learned more than before you ever took the quiz. These are not the only possible ways you could solve the, the, the quiz um, questions, but I just give you some possible ideas on how to handle them. Any technique that uses basic and fundamental principles of mathematics is acceptable as well. So we'll look at the quiz answers here, but not the questions themselves. So it's important for you to better understand or gain from the solutions. You have to first of all go and watch the video for the questions themselves. Try it, write down your answers and then watch the solution and see what you do not know so that you learn and grow. So today we are going to look at the 10 questions that we, we had in that uh, quiz. And my idea is not that you had, you are supposed to have 10 on 10, that's not important. The importance is that in the process of trying to look for these solutions, you got to learn. So question number one, it was about remainder theorem. Remainder theorem, these are ideas you already started learning from form four and form five and lower six. And here I'm trying to expand it to functions, avoiding to put numbers of things that are easy, but trying to test if you understand the concepts. So the first question said that there were two functions, f of x and g of x, and that both of them were divided by x squared plus one and left remainders x plus one and x minus one respectively. They were asked now to look for the remainder if f of x multiplied by g of x is divided by x squared plus one. So we are told that f of x when divided by x plus one plus one, x squared plus one, the remainder was x plus one. So that means I can express it in this form. So it means f of x is equal to x squared plus one times another polynomial plus that remainder. In a similar way, we can do the same thing for g of x with another polynomial g of x and a remainder. So we expect that if f of x plus g of x is also divided by x squared plus 1, then we should be able to get something like this where we can actually just read out what will be here as our remainder. Because these two hold, I could just multiply the two of them. So on my left hand side will be equal to right hand side with the product of these two. So if I multiply them here, I will just open up. So this times this gives me the first term here. That's x squared plus 1 squared p of x times q of x plus this multiplied by that is x minus 1 times that. I will do the same thing with this and do that. So I get four new terms. One, two, three, four. The last one is special because it doesn't have anything to do with x squared plus 1 or p of x or q of x. But if you open it up, you get x squared minus 1. Our intention is to be able to factorize, to get something like x squared plus 1 outside of this term and something apart. So I can play with this here. To get x squared plus 1 minus 1 because here I have put a plus 1 but there was no plus 1 there. So if I minus the 1 and there was already another minus 1 I get minus 2. Then I can now factorize this on every term. This one is here, this one is here, this one is here, this one is here. So I can factorize it. This is squared here so 1 remains. Take this out. It's taken out. x minus 1 p of x and x plus 1 q of x. And then of course this term here only 1 remains. The minus 2 is standing by the side. It's not part of the factors that he is not taking care of with this factor. So it means I can express it in this form where I get my x squared plus 1. All of this in these big brackets is t of x and then minus 2. So my remainder is minus 2. For question number 2, you are told if a, b, all of them are greater than 1, you should try to solve this. Yeah, we need that condition for this to make some sense. One key way of solving quartile equation where you have roots is trying to square them. It helps. The most important is also to play around with the terms so that it's easy for you. But 
otherwise you can do it any way you want as comfortable as you like so to do that i square both sides of this if i do that i come out with what you see there and then i can rearrange fix my terms this square and the square root fall off square square root fall off and again i can take every other thing to this side so minus one minus one that's minus two when it comes to this i become plus two plus two and the minus one i get that and that and then a and b they come this way to be minus so i'm left only with this term here if you look at this critically you can actually factorize them can show you that the factors of this are this a minus one times b minus one a times b is a b a times minus one is minus a minus one times b is minus b minus one times minus one is plus one so you see then i can divide both sides by root a minus one root b minus one this a minus b to the one power this b minus one to the one power and here this is to the half power so i can apply my ideas of exponents and fix them and you get this I can square both sides just to do away with the square root, which is not very convenient and comfortable. It's not beautiful enough to sit in the mat salon. So we'll make it beautiful, right? So in that case, now it's just left for me to look for pairs of A and B, which will satisfy this equation. And if you do that, you will see that there are three of them. So the answer was C. Then for question number three, you're asked to look for the equation of the perpendicular bisector of the line joining those two points there. So the key things that you are supposed to remember, I have two, the equation of a line given two points. You should already know that. That's y minus y1 is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1 times x minus x1. But then, this is special. So the gradient there, this is the normal gradient of the line, normal line between A and B. But I'm looking for the perpendicular bisector. So it means that gradient is supposed to be minus 1 all over this gradient. Because the product of the gradient of two lines that are perpendicular to each other should be equal to minus 1. So if I play with that, then I get A all over 4B. And that's what I will use in my equation when I'm now doing below here. So I just take, I choose one point of my, yeah, I just take A or B, then that should be fine. You can rearrange this. The idea was to you to write it in this form. So I also wanted to see that you can actually do some algebra to, to, to fix it, to make it look nice, to make it look beautiful us in the saloon so if you did that then you see that your p is equal to 8b and that was e question number four here is the same like the question number six we had for the o level so i advise you to look at the o level solutions and you see the answer there is d for question number five there was a special question that i dedicated to students of Benga Tamasco Moliko because of their participation. They have really been enthusiastic and I thank you, of course. I thank all the other students also from Yaoundé, Holy Infants, all the other places that are Glory Balingua, Nyala, all those places. Please, thank you for your participation and I hope you are learning and you are getting yourself prepared for the future of mathematics. So this was a simple question. The idea was simply to take this function that is given to you, equated to 1, solve for t, convert the t's in terms of uh, time and then you would see that yeah in terms of hours if you change to minutes then you would get that form so if you solve those two equations this was not a simple one that you could just factorize so it was important to use the quadratic equation formula this is something that you know and then you get two of the solutions t equal to that or that and that means you have to look indicate from what time to what time so the smallest one if the time when it would be for the first time one degree and then till the time when it stops from being one degree and if you check that and arrange them well then you have at 3 18 a.m the temperature dropped to that and it remained there up to 4 42 a.m then it went back to a temperature higher than one degree and the answer was c so if we look at question number six you ask that yeah here there was quite some work you had to do you, I, my idea was just to test your idea about polynomials. What do you know about order of polynomial? What does that mean? When a polynomial goes through points given coordinates, what does that mean? That was the main thing here. So a fourth order poly a polynomial here simply means your polynomial should have a power of x as to the four as maximum. It doesn't matter. You don't need to always have all of this, but since you don't know, it was a good idea just to assume that they all existed. And then since they do pass through this point, mean they satisfy. These points satisfy that equation. So each x here, if you put here, it should give you a corresponding y. So when x is minus 3, I put minus 3 on the place of x, y should be equal to 28. 
If you did that, you get the number of equations that you could solve. One was already simple. It was minus two. If you solve that well and did the sum all of them, then you will see that this was the sum of those where was equal to zero. But that's not enough. I needed the sum for all of them. Also that of the second polynomial. For the second polynomial, that is where the work was supposed to be. We are told that it's a fourth other polynomial. It already has three as a double root, so I can get that there. And then, of course, since it's a fourth order, I can express it in this form. It's a nice form there. You can get it x multiplied by that, multiplied by that. So if we do this, we also told that it satisfied these two. Only two points were given there. So if that is the case, then I could also say, okay, when x is two, y should be equal to six. So I put six here, and I fit in two there, and I come up with an equation, one. Four and 28, if I do that, I come up with that. If I solve these two, I got a equal to 2, b equal to minus 1. But watch out here. The a and b are not the coefficients of the polynomial. These are the coefficients of the factors that I got from there. So if I do that now, I can fix it. I can now say, okay, I can expand this based on the value of a and b that I obtain, and I will get this equation, which is 2x to the fourth power minus 13x cubed plus 24x squared minus 9x. And if you do this well, you can check those coefficients. You sum them, you should get 4. And if I sum the 4 and the 0 that I had before, then that should be 4. So the answer was B. So we go to question number seven. Question number seven is very similar to the one we already saw. He had again to do with roots. So one of the important things to be able to square things out. So the first thing I could do here is I take this minus X that is here alone and push it to the right hand side. So that all what I have on my left hand side are with roots. Then it's easy for me. Otherwise, trying to expand three things like this is very, it's much more complicated. So if I did that, then I come up with this simpler form. I pick everything that does have a root again to one side, like here, I took it to the left, and fix it, and again, I square again. If you did that, then you come up with this. This is not difficult. You can factorize x square out and then get some term inside. And if you solve, you get three possible solutions. x squared to 21 cannot work. You can test it. Here, you see that it's not going to work. That's why it's not a solution. So there are only these two possibilities. And if you square them and sum, then you get 25. And that was D. For question number eight, we're just to test the idea about even and odd functions. Even and odd functions. I'm sorry the scanning cut this off again. But whatever the case, a real function is said to be even if f of minus x is f of x, which means f of a negative number gives me the same result as x of the number without the negative. But for a real function which is odd, f of a negative number would be minus f of that number without the negative. So that means, for example, f of minus 1 will be the same like minus f of 1. So it's just the same thing. Just test them. Test them in the four functions that were given. If I try the first one, for example, f of minus 1x, you get minus x on that. And if you play with it, you get that. You see that this is odd. If you do that here, you see that yeah, everything changed to positive and it looks exactly as the original function. So we say this is even. If you check the third one, that was neither even nor odd and i was odd. So there were two odds and one even there. So the answer was C. If you look at question number nine, question number nine, that was the one that was also relatively new here. I tried to combine ideas of indices and logarithm in one question. So it was important that the students here try to understand that. For example, two, 4 here is 2 squared. But 2 to the power 2 times this is the same like 2 to the power of 3, all that squared. Because a to the m, all that to the n, is a to the m n. That was the idea there. It's a similar thing here. I could split this as 2 to the power 4. And I put the 4 there. I can push the 4 up. And the 4 will remove the root. And I get only 3. This log of a, b... It just is my log a plus log b. So I can fix this to look like that. And then these are all on the power. So this is one log mu to the base mu is one. So this is two to this power times two to that power. Because a to the m times a to the n is a to the m plus n. If the bases are the same. So I can see that. I can then let t to be equal to this. And then if I do that, I get this quadratic equation that I can solve. And then see that 4 is equal to that, and 4 is 2 to the 2. So if my bases are the same, my power should be the same. And then I see that, yeah, 
mu to the power 2 is equal to 3, but our starts over the value of 2 mu squared, so just 2 times 3, and that is 6. And that's C. This question number 10 has been done at least 4 or 5 times in those quizzes, so I advise you to look at some of the quizzes that have already been done. So you see here the answer was A. Thank you once again for listening, and if you have problems, please feel free, leave a comment for me, and uh, yeah, I'll come back to that. Share with your friends, share the link, share with people that you think can be helped. Have a wonderful day and bye.